Sunday nights, we're in the book of Revelation, and we're looking at Revelation from the viewpoint of the number seven. Now, seven, when you go into studies of numbers, we've been studying numbers, and we've studied gematria, and gematria is a, is a study of words in the Bible that add up, and, they, and some of them, they would be uncanny if it wasn't the Word of God, and uh, that's where every letter of the Greek alphabet and every letter of the Hebrew alphabet was given a numerical value. It would start with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and then it'd go to 200, uh, 300, 400, and so forth. And when these letters were given these uh, numerical values, uh, certain words would add up to certain things, and it was just unbelievable. I did a series on uh, on gematria, and I don't know how many tapes we had in that, but sometimes it's just literally unbelievable how these things worked out. In fact, one time I took all the names of the uh, all the names of the of the righteous lineage of God through Adam, and went from Adam all the way down, went from Adam to Jacob. Adam all the way to Jacob, and that's 22 generations, and we took all 22 names, and we put them up on the board and took their numerical values and added them up, but we took Jacob's righteous name, Israel, and we took Abram's righteous name, Abraham, which means father of many nations, and Israel means to prevail with God. Jacob, of course, means supplanter or heel catcher. It means a deceiver, one who deceives another. And Abraham's unrighteous name was Abram. And Abram, or A-B-R-A-M, Abram means high father or proud father. Abraham means father of many nations. We went from Adam all the way to Jacob, and that added up to exactly 7,000. And any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000 is a form of the original number, and that's going to come in handy when we get further in this message. Now, one more time, let me give you this. In the Hebrew language, since the Bible is a Jewish book, and that certainly includes uh, the New Testament, that includes the New Testament, all the Bible, the Old and New Testament, is a Jewish book. In the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament is called the shadow of, are the literal, the literal. And in the New Testament, in the New Testament, it's called the very image, very image, or the spiritual. The real thing is the spiritual. The, the shadow is going to disappear one day. The shadow will disappear, or the literal will pass away at Christ's coming, but what will live forever is the very image. If I go out into the sun and I cast a shadow, and the Scripture tells us about these shadows. In fact, look at it over here in Hebrews. Then we'll get back to Revelation. But look in Hebrews one more time. The Scripture says there in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 10th chapter in verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. Well, the Old Testament will give you a literal. It'll give you a literal, uh, it'll give you a literal Jew or a literal Israelite. And those are people that actually lived in the confines of the parameters of this borders of Israel. Well, in the New Testament, the Bible says in the last few verses of Romans, the second chapter, that a Jew is not a Jew outwardly, but a Jew of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. You had literal circumcision over here. You got spiritual circumcision over here. That's the cutting off of sin over here. And then, of course, you had a temple over here where they met, and that temple, of course, was constructed like so, and it had a, 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 a door at the eastern end of it on the eastern end, and then, of course, it had a veil here, and then inside the veil it had the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant, uh, it, had the, uh, uh, it had Aaron's rod that budded, Aaron's rod, 
It had the, the pot of manna, of manna, and it also had the, uh, it had the law written on tables of stone, tables of stone. And now in the New Testament, in the New Testament, uh, the rod is a rod of righteousness according to the, that's the word rabdos. It's a rod of righteousness, not a literal rod. And there in Hebrews 1 and 8, and then the pot of manna, that's the bread. And Jesus is the bread come down from heaven there in the 6th chapter of John. And the, tab the law written on tables of stone, according to 2 Corinthians, the 3rd chapter there, the 3rd chapter, uh, the law is now written on fleshy tables of the heart. Now, all this goes back and forth. Everything, and of course you had the candlesticks here in the outer sanctuary, and you had the, the uh, uh, altar of incense, that is the prayers of the saints, according to Revelation, the fifth chapter. The candlesticks is the church, according to Revelation, the first chapter. And the oil inside the candlesticks is the preachers of the churches, or the angels. An angel is A-G-G-E-L-O-S, angelos, and that means a messenger. And all the preachers of the churches were called angels because because angel is just the common Greek word for messenger. It does not necessarily mean something spiritual. It can, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. And then, of course, you had the table of showbread up here on the north end, and it had the bread on it, uh, the loaves of bread. And the Bible says, now we being many are one bread and one body. So the church is the bread now. And then you had the uh, brazen sea here, and now we're washed in the blood of Christ. And then you had the altar right here on the east of that. And the altar was where they killed all the sacrifices. And now the, the cross is the altar where we give our bodies a living sacrifice daily. So all of this, this uh, comes together in this fashion. And you find that the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled seven times. And seven is the number of righteousness. And on the Day of Atonement, that was the tenth day tenth day of the seventh month, seventh month on the Jewish calendar, that's the month Tishri, T-I-S-H, all right, that's the seventh month on their calendar, and uh, the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled seven times, and you find sevens all through the Old Testament, and that number seven is very important because it's considered one of the most righteous of all the numbers. Now, what's amazing is that among the Jews, they said that 10 was a secular uh, complete number and that 7 was a spiritual complete number and the 10th day of the 7th month was the Day of Atonement. So let's go back to the number 7 and that's what we're talking about is 7s. And in the Hebrew language, the number 7 is the word, number 7 is the word, uh, Shaba, uh, is the word Sheba, S-H-E-B-A, S-H-E-B-A, and Sheba comes from the word Shaba, Shaba, and this word Sheba is the cardinal number or the number seven is what it is. These come from the exact same root, and Shaba means to take an oath. An oath on our part is half of a contract. God gives the contract just like when you buy a house. And the, then the stronger of the parties, which would be the seller in a, buying a house, dictates what the, dictates what the uh, uh, conditions of selling the house will be or when you buy a house. The seller is the strongest of the parties. In God's contract, which he calls a covenant, a covenant in the Old Testament... A covenant, and of course that is the word B-E-R-I-Y-T-H, berith, and the berith is God's covenant. It's called a diatheke or a testament. Testament in the New, in the New Testament is called a testament or D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E, and diatheke, of course, comes from dia and T-I-T-H-E-M-I, that word tithme. The word tithme means to level oneself passively towards another, and when you bow to God, you keep his testament, and that's when you become sevened. This word Shabbat means to seven oneself. 
This word taking an oath means to seven one's self. That's the word Shabbat, and it comes from the word seven. So when you take an oath to God, you become sevened, or it means to be complete, completed. And, of course, the New Testament word for completed, whenever Jesus would say, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, there in the sixth chapter, last verse of the sixth chapter of Matthew, uh, that when he says, Be ye therefore perfect, he uses the word either T-E-L-E-I-O-S, and we have other words like when the perfect is come, that's T-E-L-E-I-O-T-E-S. This either means complete or to be completed. We get the word telos from this, and that means, some, that means completion. And when, you, when we're completed, that's when we go through the fire. We start in our early lives, and God chose us before the world began, and then we start as young believers, young believers, and we don't know a whole lot about what we're doing, and we kind of breach this thing called Christianity ignorantly and with a great lot of zeal and not a lot of knowledge. And then God has to start whipping us, and he whips us all of our lives, thinking not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. And that word strange is the word X-E-N-I-Z-O. It comes from the word X-E-N-O-S, which is the word stranger, and that means an occasional, occasional guest. Do not think when you're a believer that the fiery trial is an occasional guest. It's not. It's required daily in your life because you are being sevened. You're being sevened. And I like to use the, I like to say to people, think of the number seven more as an adjective than as a number because we are being sevened. We are a sevened people is what we are. So as we're being sevened, God puts us through the fire. Peter said uh, in 1 Peter 1 and 7, he says the trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. So we're not to pray that the sevening process goes away. And as we go into Revelation, if, if this is a Jewish book, and it is, and we see the candlesticks in Revelation, and we see the seven angels, and we see the temple of God in Revelation, and we see the throne, which is the Ark of the Covenant in Revelation, and we see the brazen sea, which was the sea in front of the front door. It was, it was a sea of glass, and that's where the women brought their looking glasses. Uh, their looking glasses were made of bronze, and they brought them to Moses. He required that they bring them to him so that they could make the sea out of it. And that's why it's called a sea of glass, because it was made out of the looking glasses of the people there in the fourth chapter of Revelation. And also in the 15th chapter, you see the glassy sea. Now, we're talking about being seven. And of course, in Revelation, you've got all these sevens. You've got seven churches, seven spirits. Well, let me write them up on the board one more time for those of y'all that haven't been here. Here's all the sevens of Revelation. This is a Jewish number. And without it, we cannot understand the book of Revelation. If we do not understand what seven has, what seven means, you have seven churches. Let me write these down for you one more time. Seven churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets. Do you think seven has something to do with this? Do you think seven is important? Seven trumpets, seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes. Concerning the seven candlesticks, the, there in Zechariah 4 and 10, the Bible says, These seven are the eyes of the Lord. And, of course, uh, he said that Israel there in Zechariah, I believe it's 1 and 8, he says, Israel is the apple of my eye. Apple, and the word apple is the word B-A-B-A-H, and it means pupil. Pupil. Israel is the pupil of my eye. And when we see, color, when we see shapes, we don't see shapes. What you see is you see 
refraction or separation of colors in your eye. And we're the light of the world, aren't we? And where does the light go into the eye? It goes into the pupil and the, and the iris is divided into two parts there. It's, it's a wheel inside of a wheel. And this inner part retracts when, when someone is punched in the eye. And Jesus is coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. He said, anyone that touches Israel touches the apple or the pupil of my eye. He's saying, you've punched me in the eye when you touch my church or my Israel, my true Israel. You lay a hand on them and you have punched me in the eye, God said. Well, what's amazing is when the light goes into the eye and it goes through the lens, the lens in the back of the eye. Here's, I know how the lens is because I had mine removed and I had cataracts removed from the lens. Now you've got the cornea out here. Then you have the, uh, you have the lens back here in the back and the lens is, uh, is triangular, triangle-shaped prisms. When you pass light through a prism, what happens? You go into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The light is refined into seven colors. And what we are predestined to is to conform to the image or the likeness of Christ, and he is the light, isn't he? So the shape that God will see in us the shape that he will see in us is the colors that are refracted in Christ is represented in colors in Revelation the first chapter, in Revelation the tenth chapter, and in Daniel the eleventh chapter, Jesus is, uh, the Bible speaks of Christ, represented in colors, and we've gone through some of the colors. In fact, uh, in fact, when you, uh, when, when Noah pitched the ark within and without with pitch, he pitched, the pitch was a red stained color. It was red stained color. And pitch, pitch is, was something called chemer, C-H-E-M-E-R. And it was, the, the common name for it was bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-E-N. It was asphalt in its natural state and it came out of the ground and it was a red color and they used it they used the red color to, to caulk the boat so that they wouldn't sink. Well, they pitched the ark with red. Red. Well, they went through 370 days inside the ark, smelling nothing but each other's armpits and a whole bunch of animal manure. And no one took a bath for three. 170 days inside the ark. Now, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And then they stayed five months in the ark, or 150 days, uh, till, the, it, till the water began to assuage or go down. And then on the 370th day, or the 10th day of the first month of the second year, which is 370 days, since the Jewish calendar has 360 days, on that day, 370 days, the, they came to a stop on Mount, the mountains of Ararat. Well, do you think 370 days smelling nothing but cow manure and lime manure and uh, all of this manure of all these animals and it's stinking and it's hot, would you call that a fiery trial? Whew, I guess. <laughs> no doubt it's a fiery trial. All through the Bible, all through the Bible, Fire is represented as yellow. Now, when you mix red with yellow, what do you... Red plus yellow equals what? Orange. Orange is a Latin word, A-R-U-W-M, and it is the word gold. When you when you're pitched with the blood of Christ and you go through fiery trials, gold is always the color all through the Bible of maturity or completion. What Noah and his family was, they were sevened, sevened 
while they were in the ark. Can you see that? Huh? Now, that's not, that's not, that's not, it's not so much amazing as it's how God worked even the colors in the Bible to blend together. Now, we're talking about all these things, and I got to the, I got to the seven eyes, and I got off there, so you can see just the, just the magnificence of the seven eyes. And the seven eyes are the candlesticks, aren't they? Huh? Well, let me, let's read those verses there. Let's go over here. Let's go over here to Zechariah. Zechariah. The, Zechariah is the next last book of the Old Testament. Let's read this. I'm going to try to get on. I didn't mean to get off to the side and sidetrack here, but I did, didn't I? I? It just came to me I needed to explain that to you because that has to do with being seven, too. And Noah had to be seven. Chapter 4, speaking of the candlesticks, out of verse 2, when you go to verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven candlesticks. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Now, wait a minute. The seven, seven candlesticks, seven candlesticks equals, equals the eyes of the Lord, doesn't it? Okay, let me show you this now. I don't think I've even pointed this out to you. If the seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord then anything that the seven candlesticks are is equal to the eyes of the Lord, isn't it? Look at Revelation, first chapter. First chapter, Revelation, first chapter. Verse 20. And the mystery of the seven stars that we saw on the right hand of Christ in verse 16. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. The right hand is the hand of authority. And Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Now, the Father is a spirit. It doesn't actually mean that he's sitting to the right of the Father. It doesn't mean the Father is a gray-headed man on the throne up there somewhere. Right hand meant authority. The prince was always the authority of the king in the kingdom. Whenever the king wanted something done, he would dispense the, the prince out to bring these things out. So he says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks from verse 12 and 13... The seven stars are the messengers, the angelos, the angels, are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Look here. Seven candlesticks equals seven churches. Well, look here. If the seven candlesticks equals the eyes of the Lord, then the not actually seven churches. There were seven churches in Asia, but there were many more than that. Seven being a number of completion, how many churches are there? There's only one church, and I believe that is put there to show us the completed church. Here's the completed church right here. Here's the seven candlesticks. The seven candlesticks does not mean they're individual separate seven candlesticks. How many candlesticks are here? One lamp, isn't it? With seven arms. But it's one unit, and it's being sevened, and that's a picture of us. Do I believe that's talking about us being sevened or going to the pie trial? I mean, that's exactly what it's talking about. And, of course, the angels is the message that's in the church. We're the church. The word church is ecclesia, E-K, E-K, K-L-E-S-I-A, ecclesia. It comes from ek, and K-A-L-E-O, kaleo, and that means, kaleo means to call, ek means out. We're called out of this world to live godly and live righteously, but we won't do it on our own until he sevens us. And when we're sevened, we will speak the truth. It'll come out of our mouths. And what's going to come out of these candlesticks is a flame, which is the light. In seven, you got seven lights there. And how, and how many colors do we have in our eyes when, 
when these uh, colors begin to be refracted and you also have inside the eye, what is amazing, somebody knew this, uh, what you have in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the eye, you have, here's the lens, here's the, the cornea here, and back in the back, you've got something called the fovea centralis, F-O-V-E-A, C-E-N-T-R-A-L-I-S, or the yellow spot, yellow spot, that's what it's called, that's the common name for it, and that, and the yellow spot in the back of the eye, yellow spot right directly straight in the eye is the yellow spot, and that is the beginning of the refinement of the colors. They actually start a refining as they go through the cornea, and then you've got hundreds of thousands of hexagonal shaped prisms, hexagonal shaped prisms in the eye, and they are prisms, and these hexagonal shaped prisms are, uh, they start refining the colors, and when you look at the candlesticks, originally the candlesticks, if these were all equal, if they were equal, equal if the arms were of equal length, what you would have, you would have, they're not because most people don't know this, on the Ark of Titus, they would look like this, and you've actually got a hexagon, or you've got the Star of David. And it was said by the rabbis that David wore this, these uh, menorah, they, it was said by the rabbis, David wore the menorah on his shield. Well, what is this called right here? This is called Shield of David, Megan David. We get the word Mogan David wine, which means Shield of David. So it was said he wore this on the shield. When, they, when David went out to battle, he did not, I do not believe that he wore this right here. He did, but he wore it. When you look at the floral pattern, look at it from the top, you look at the floral pattern on the Ark of Titus when it was captured and taken into captivity, and this is what you see on the floral pattern, and I believe this is what David carried out when he went into battle. Now, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I like it. Oh, by the way, yes. And this membrane here, thank you, Mary, the membrane around the that was on the inside, that was just attached to the retina, was called Jacob's membrane. Isn't that amazing? All this goes together. It's all, God has structured His Word mathematically. People that don't see that, it's because they don't, well, I, it is a lot because they don't study, and I will say this. I understand that God lets me see things. I have studied some of this stuff. I have been studying on the Star of David for 35 years. Uh, back years ago, uh, Mary wrote letters for me back in the early 70s to, uh, to uh, uh, Hebrew universities all over America. And I got all these letters back, and I accidentally threw them away one time with some garbage. And I got all these letters that was telling me all about the Star of David. And I've got, of course, I've got... Uh, things on the Star of David in the, in the Jewish encyclopedias I have and in the McLennan and Strong, you can go into that. In fact, uh, I think I've got that here. Let me see here. Yeah. Do I have it? Uh, yeah, here it is. Well, I thought it was here. Let me see. Candlesticks. Yeah, here it is. Well, no, I was looking for the... Uh, hold on here. See if I've got it. Megan David. Of course, there's the star. I've got a picture of it. Is it in here? Hold on. Maybe in here. And it shows you right beside the... Uh... Well, I don't, I don't see it here. I thought I had it with me. But it's right beside the, right beside the Star of David. It's got the... It's got right beside the menorah. It's got the Star of David. And that comes out of the McClinic and Strong. But let's go on here. Now, I had to stop just a minute. What am I doing putting that over there? Put it over here. 
I had to stop for a moment when we got to the seven eyes. So when you get to the seven eyes, you already can see what that is when you get into Revelation and the seven eyes. Well, let me just, let's just read that. Since we went through this, since we went through this, let's look at, uh, at the seven eyes in Revelation 5 and 6. Go to Revelation 5 and 6. This is the only place it's mentioned, but one time is enough. Revelation 5 and verse 6, since I explained that to you. And I beheld in lo in the midst of the throne. Now, the throne of God, the throne of God was inside the, it was inside the, the uh, holy place. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was here. And uh, well, you had the candlesticks out here. Now, God would come down out of the kind of glory. Look here. It's kind of glory. He would come down and sat down on the Ark of the Covenant inside the Shekinah glory. And he, that was his throne right here. God sat down right there. So when it's talking about here, it says, I beheld him low in the midst of the throne or in the midst of the Ark of the Covenant and of the four beasts, there were four beasts there. You had, you had one, on, one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. They were cherubim or cherubim. And you had two of them embossed on the you had two of them embossed on the uh, veil of the temple, so there were four of them there. I've gone through that. They stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. So these seven are the eyes of the Lord. It could be nothing other than the candlesticks when they are lit. That's the eyes of the Lord. And that's the church, isn't it? Huh? Let me give you one other verse on this. Go over here to Second Chronicles 16. Second Chronicles 16. 16 and verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord... What's the eyes of the Lord? Seven candlesticks. And what else is it? The church. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect, in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, speaking to uh, Asa when he tries to employ an evil king to go against Beasha. But he said, don't you know that the eyes of the Lord, God's people... Israel goes throughout the whole earth to show God strong to those whose hearts are perfect. You notice how many eyes are there? Seven. What does seven have to do with? Perfect or being completed, right? So when you see whose hearts are perfect, that's the seven eyes are being seven before the Lord. Now, let me finish this list. I'm, I just wanted to kind of put that in there. I meant to bring that up before. I think I brought it up to some degree, but not to this degree. That's what the seven eyes are there in Revelation, the fifth chapter. That's what they're there for. Same thing all the way through the Bible. Now, where was I? Seven eyes, seven thunders. Seven thunders. Then you had seven heads. Of course, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the harlot sits, and the harlot is Babylon, or let us make us a name system. Seven heads, seven crowns, seven last plagues, seven golden vials, now the seven golden vials hold the last plagues. You remember the, the temple from the, from the altar out here, the fire uh, had to be taken in a golden vial to light the altar of incense here. And that smoke went up before the Lord as a sweet-smelling savor. So you got seven golden vials, seven mountains, 
And the seven mountains we've already studied are the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And we've already said that, that uh, so many times that a mountain was a capital city of an empire. And this is, and the beast has seven heads or seven mountains. And those mountains uh, start at the time that John wrote this in 96 AD. Uh, Rome was ruling. And Rome was the existing mountain of the beast world system. A mountain was a capital city is what it was called. And that's not something I made up. You can get that out of under Mount in McClinic and Strong's Encyclopedia. And then you had seven mountains. You had uh, seven kings. And seven kings have to do with the seven heads. They're actually equated with the seven heads or the seven mountains. And then you have seven kings. And that's the total of all the sevens. Now, why would all those sevens be there? If seven didn't have the same significance that it has in the Old Testament, I believe it has the exact same significance because God is speaking of Jewishness all the way through Revelation, isn't he? Then why would, why would the book of Revelation be a Jewish book and yet, at the, by the same token, seven not being a Jewish number? I believe it's exactly a Jewish number and, of course, this is about the revelation of Christ. When you talk about the book of Revelation, I'm going to erase this here. I need to make some copies of the seven sevens of Revelation. Now, all right. And we're talking about the seven angels. We've gone through so much... I'm, this is about my 32nd or 33rd tape on the book of Revelation. Now, how can you go that long on Revelation? We have gone through so much in this book. But let's get back to the seven angels because the seven angels, I've said this so many times, that the first chapter of Revelation is a glossary and that last verse tells you what the glossary of the book is. You're going to be able to find it all the way through the book. And uh, when you go into that 20th verse, the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, are the messengers or the preachers of the refined church. When you see seven, think of refined of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the refined church, are the seven churches. Now, you do have seven churches in two and three of Revelation, and I'll come back to that at a later date to show what is wrong with the church when it's not seven yet. And God shows that in all of these seven churches here. I believe seven is a number that God picked out because you had many more than seven churches in Asia. Now, let's look one more time. You have the seven angels in 1 and 20. And back, the next time you have the seven angels is very significant because they hold the seven trumpets. Now, trumpets are voices. So, the seven churches, if the angels are there, the church is here, isn't it? The church hasn't been carried away somewhere in a pre-trib rapture. Don't you believe that at all? We're going to be changed at the last trump. Last is the word eschatos. E-S-C-H-A, C-H-A-T-O-S. Last trump is one we want to be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. And from last, we get, it comes from the word echo. That's a, that's a Greek word, which means to hold. Now, we think of an echo being holding a sound. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The last is the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound. And we see the seven angels with the seven trumpets. If the seven angels are here, these are called trumpets. You got seven trumpets, and we're going to sound, as a refined church, we're going to sound the Word of God out. That's what we're going to do. And uh, when God refines you, at 65, I really don't mind saying anything to anybody. And I was a little bit scared when I was 24, 25 to be out in public and tackle somebody. If I was out in public and I was going to start witnessing somebody, my heart would go boom, 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 boom. Well, they don't do that anymore. I just walk up to somebody. 
I know that I've usually got about 5,000 answers to their one question because they don't usually have any good questions, and I'll just go. I've been in the middle of men who were big, tall guys, and they would start throwing stuff at me and trying to argue with me. I said, no, that's not right because the Bible says, wait a minute. And you, it's like being, being in the world with these so-called, quote, Christians. It's like being in a kindergarten with a whole bunch of little kids trying to instruct you about uh, uh, high school algebra. And that's what it sounds like to me. No, that's not right. Where did you come up with that? All you have to know to be out in public, to be able to, to be assured that you can overcome the enemy is no more than the average man in the, in a, in the grocery store. And how much is that to know more than the, than the smartest guy in the grocery store? You don't have to know much. You don't have to know much of anything. If you learn a lot, you're going to feel like you're around a bunch of little kids. I mean, it's kind of like when you have somebody come in your class, Jerry, and they don't know anything. Uh, have you ever had any kids start trying to tell you anything in class? That, well, uh, Mr. Moss, here's what I think. Well, we don't care what you think, you know. Do you know anything about English? When Jerry was in Tuland I, you could see when a new young guy came in, couldn't you? And he didn't know nothing, but he starts telling you what it's all about. Well, I can tell you when these preachers and these so-called Christians here know anything, and I very seldom ever hear anybody talk that knows anything. They, everybody's got an opinion and some imagination about what they think. Now, let's look here, and we've got the seven trumpets in Revelation 8 and 2, the seven angels, so the church is still here. Wherever the angels are, the candlesticks have to be there, don't they? So the eyes of the Lord are there, or the church is there, isn't it? Because the seven angels, the message inside the candlesticks is the oil. The oil inside the candlesticks is a picture of the Holy Spirit. That's truth that's in us. The Word of God is truth. The Holy Spirit's truth. So the Word comes out of our mouth, and that lights up the candlesticks. But you won't do that until you become bold enough in the Lord to speak out. Now, that's after you've been sevened. We have to keep that in mind. Now, all right. You got the seven angels in verse 2. I saw the seven angels. So therefore, the seven candlesticks are there, aren't they? Without the seven angels, the candlesticks, without the, the candlesticks, the seven angels, do not the refined message has no place or purpose. The container of the seven angels or the container of the oil, the message of God, is the candlesticks, isn't it? That's what it is. That's the container. So wherever you find the Spirit, or you find the seven angels or the message of God, the candlesticks has to be there. It is a necessity. So the church hasn't been taken out here. I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them was given seven trumpets. Well, we've said already, according to the fourth chapter of Revelation, that trumpets are voices. In fact, back there in Revelation 4, uh, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in the heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, trumpets talking. Then in Revelation 1, in verse uh, 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet talking to me. So when you see the trumpets, that's our words coming out of our refined mouths. Our lives have been refined, and we begin to preach the Word of God regardless of the cost, even if it's our life. Then we see the seven angels there, and we see they have seven trumpets, and when the last one sounds, we're going, uh, the mystery of God is finished. That's the church. Then you see in Revelation 8 and 6, 8 and 6, and the seven angels and the seven candlesticks are there. The seven angels which had the seven trumpets or the seven voices prepared themselves to sound. Verse 1, the first angel, uh, verse 7, the first angel sounded. Verse 2, the second angel sounded. Verse, verse 8, the second angel sounded. Verse 10, the third angel sounded. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounds. Chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounds. 
chapter 9 and verse 13, the sixth angel sounds. In chapter 10 and verse 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the refinement of the church totally, where we begin to sound and speak the truth, and we pay with our lives. During the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. The mystery of Christ there in the third chapter of Ephesians is that the Gentile church should be fellow heirs and of the same body as the Jews. It's also found in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Paul, Paul says, I speak unto you a mystery. I speak of Christ and the church. There's two mysteries. One is the mystery of iniquity. That's lawlessness. That is no word of God. Lawlessness and the mystery of Christ or the mystery of God. That is the church. Church. Those are the two mysteries. Now, that when, the, when the seventh or the last trumpet sounds... The last of seven trumpets, I've said it so many times, the Jews had seven trumpets, seven trumpets on their ecclesiastical calendar. They started in the month Nisan, and they went to the month Tishri, the seventh month, and each month they had a new moon festival at the first of the month, new moon, and at the new moon festival they would sound a trumpet and at Tishri, that was the end of the harvest. The end of the harvest was the end gathering, and that was connected with the Day of Atonement. And when the, when the wheat and the tares are gathered in, God's going to separate the wheat from the tares. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. At the end gathering of the harvest, and when we're gathered in, it will be at the seventh trumpet. And there were seven trumpets when Joshua marched around Jericho, and at the seventh one, on the seventh day, seven priests with seven trumpets sounded on the seventh time marching around Jericho. They sounded the trump, and they shouted, and the walls fell down. That's the way judgment's going to come to the world. When the last trumpet sounds, we're going to be changed, and judgment will be here, and it will be uh, as it was with Noah and the ark. They knew not until Noah went into the ark, then the fountains of the great deep broke up. Judgment was just immediate like that. Nobody ran up the, up the gangplank and said, Noah, let me in. No one did that because the Bible says the fountains of the great deep were broken. The crust of the earth just exploded when God shut the door and the ark probably went up on a thousand foot tidal wave and they were drowned immediately. Now, and then God had to cleanse the earth as they went through this red plus yellow equal mature gold. Now, all right, now where was I? Okay, you also have the seventh, you have twice the seventh trumpet mentioned, 11 and 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He conquers all kingdoms at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And at the seventh trumpet, our bodies are going to be changed. And then we find the seven trump, the seven angels in 15 and 8. 15 and 8. Uh, excuse me, 15 and 1. 15 and 6. 15 and 8. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels. That's the church is here too. The seven candlesticks have to be here because the seven candlesticks is the container of the seven angels or the refined message of God having the seven last plagues. And then you find in 15 and 6, the seven angels came out of the temple. This is, this is the sounding of the trumpets of the candlesticks. It's what it is. That's the church with their voices being refined, speaking out truth, having the seven plagues. And then in chapter, and then verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels contained inside the seven candlesticks, which is the church, were fulfilled. 
Then you got 17 and 1, excuse me, 16 and 1. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying, The seven angels go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. The first angel pours out his vial in verse 2. The second angel pours out his vial. And we went through this. This is causing the world to drink of the wrath, the cup of the wrath of God. Verse 4, the third angel sounds. The third angel pours out his, his uh, uh, vial or his goblet. And then verse 8, the fourth angel pours out his vial of the wrath of God. Now, I've already gone through this. If you don't have the... If you do have the, uh, the 32 tapes I've done on the book of Revelation, we've covered so much territory on this, you have to listen to them. Then the, the fifth angel pours out his vial in verse 10. The sixth angel pours out his vial in verse 12. And then in verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. The end is here. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. And this is destruction of the great city of Babylon. Now, I want us to get back over here to the eight to the nineteenth chapter of Revelation. I saw an angel come down from heaven. I believe this is one of the angels, one of the seven angels, because this is a continual thing when you find the angels you find these seven angels all through the book now I'm going to try to explain this 20th chapter to you and I've gone through some of it already now let's begin to read here I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key of the bottomless pit ooh that sounds eerie and that sounds like there's a bottomless pit and it's real it's real fuzzy and it's real eerie and it has it's like some swamp or something and it's a deep hole in the ground 20 and 1 bottomless pit does not mean a hole in the ground with a fog coming out of it with some smoke rising out of it but that's what the bible says bottomless pit is over in revelation the ninth chapter yes but the word bottomless pit one more time i put it on the board so many times Anyone can look at this. Anyone can look this up. It does not take a genius to buy a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and look up the word bottomless pit. It takes a man who is not lazy. That's all it takes. Any sixth grader with an average IQ can look up bottomless pit. I can show him how to do it. Anybody. Bottomless pit is the word abusos, A-B-U-S-S-O-S, -S -S abusos. That's the word bottomless pit. Now, it has a meaning. We get the word abyss from that. A, let me change pins here. A-B-Y-S-S. -S. We get the word abyss. Now, we think of abyss usually as a deep, dark sea that's what we think of uh, that darkness was upon the face of the abyss the deep there in Genesis 1 and 2 but the word abyss in the New Testament is the word abusos it comes from the word bathos bathos means something that's very profound it has great Intellectual depth. I think that's kind of what we're talking about tonight, isn't it? Depth. When I say intellectual, I'm not standing up here saying, I am an intellectual. Well, if you can understand, you're an intellectual, because the word intellectual just merely means to understand. That's what it means. So if you can understand, you're an intellectual. You're a scholar. A scholar means a learner. That's what it means. You're a learner understanding. That's what it means. Bathos means something with understanding to it. In fact, the word bathos, you find it over here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Look here, 1 Corinthians. Here's the word bathos. 1 Corinthians, second chapter. 
Second chapter. Verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. There's going to be a great understanding. We see through a glass darkly now, but then face to face we'll really understand, won't we? And that's from that 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, by the truth. And we understand, don't we? For the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is truth, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Would you call that deep things of God about the eyes of the Lord and the pupil and the, and the seven uh, refining into seven colors? You would call that deep things, wouldn't you? That's what you would call it. So the deep things of God, that is the word. The word deep is bathos. Bathos is the word deep. The, the great intellectual depth of God's understanding. And God has revealed them to us, so we have a bathos, an understanding of intellectual things. When you place the alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet, in front of a word as a negative particle... It negates the word that it stands in front of and gives an opposite meaning. When it gives an opposite meaning in front of a word, it's called the alpha privative. Alpha, alpha privative. Placing the alpha in front of bathos, it translates abusos, or bottomless pit. It means a place of no knowledge, no intellectual depth, no understanding. Preachers who don't tell the truth are living in the bottomless pit, are living in the abathos or the abusos, and they have no understanding. In fact, when you look at, you look over here at the ninth chapter of Revelation, ninth chapter, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Jesus has seven stars in his right hand, doesn't he? And that's the seven angels of the seven churches, isn't it? Yes. And to him, this angel was given a key to the bottomless pit, to the place of no knowledge. And what comes out of the place of no knowledge? He opened the place of no knowledge, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Of course, the word scorpion is scorpios, S-K-O-R-P-I-O-S, and it comes, that is the noun, and then you have a verb form, and the verb form is S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O, scorpizo. And scorpizo is the verb, and it means to scatter abroad. So if you want to find out what the noun scorpion means, you go to the verb form, scorpizo, and when the Scripture says there in John 10, if you want to look at it, in John 10... These scorpions come out of the place of no knowledge. Here's what a scorpion is that has no knowledge. John, the 10th chapter, John 10, here is the verb form of the word scorpion. Right here, John 10, Jesus is speaking of himself as the door, as the good shepherd. This is the parable of the good shepherd. And he says, I, in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, the man who works for money, he preaches for a salary. And not the shepherd, he's a hired hand whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth. There's the verb form of scorpion. Scattereth the sheep. Hirelings allow 
ravening wolves to come in and scatter the flock. Hirelings are wolves who are false teachers. They are scorpions. They have no knowledge. False teachers have no knowledge. They come out of the place of no knowledge. They come out of the bottomless pit. And whether anybody likes that or not, that's the meaning of the word. Utterly astounding that I can look these things up and find them, and they can't. There's, yep, they scatter abroad. And that word scatter. And did not Jesus say, He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad, scorpizo. You either be for me or against me. If you are not for me, you scatter abroad your false teacher. That's what Jesus says. Now, and then you have again over in the 11th chapter of Revelation. In the 11th chapter, you see the two witnesses, which are two olive trees, and the two candlesticks stand before the Lord of the earth, before the God of the earth. And the two witnesses were the priest and the king. In the Old Testament, God has made us priests and kings. We are the two witnesses. I've already preached on that, going through Revelation. Verse 7, And when the church, or when the candlesticks, have finished their testimony, this is all allegorical language. You're going to miss it if you don't get into allegory. If you don't get into the metaphors that they had. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, what is the beast? What's the beast? The ruling world system, it was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome in the ancient world. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Then the Roman Empire was outlawed and reinstituted in the form of Roman Catholicism. Now, it's more than Roman Catholicism. It's Babylon. It goes all the way back to Babel in the Old Testament, Genesis 11. And the beast, the world ruling system, ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, or the place of no knowledge, shall make war against the two witnesses of the church. The world ruling system is going to try to kill us one day for the message we preach. If I live long enough, as we near the end of time, they will not allow me to preach this message. Just as sure as I'm standing here, they will not allow it and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, we'll come back to that later. Now, let's go back over here to Revelation 21. <clears throat> Let me get me a drink of water here. Revelation 21, the same bottomless pit, the place of no knowledge. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the place of no knowledge and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon... Boy, it sounds like something ominous, something eerie and spooky out of the medieval ages. Uh, uh, St. George and the dragon, he's going to kill this, <laughs> this fire-breathing dragon. There's only one problem with that. We need to define the word dragon. Dragon is the word dracon. Dracon. The word means to fascinate. Make someone to feel good. Feel good. And it has the same meaning as the serpent in Genesis 3 and 1. The serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field. See, the reason people cannot understand the Bible is they think they can interpret the Bible in a literal way with 20th and 21st century definitions, 20th and 21st century uh, reasoning in an American state of mind. How can you do that? You can't do that. You got to go back to what they said something meant in the first century. Now, dracon has the same basic meaning as the word serpent. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The word serpent is N-A-C-H-A-S-H. And that word nakash comes from a, the verb form of the same spelling that means to enchant. One of the writers says that the word enchant means to kill with the eye. What happened to Eve in the garden when she looked at the tree? 
she was enchanted, wasn't she? She saw a tree. She saw the tree that was good for food, the lust of the flesh. She saw a tree that was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. She saw a tree that make her wise, the pride of life. And she and it killed her. And did not God say, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. The first thing she did was look, and it killed her with the eye, and she became enchanted with the things of the world, didn't she? That was it. Uh, it, well, you've got, sometimes you've got nakash, and then you have nakash spelled the same way. That is a verb. It's a verb, and you have the noun form. And dracon, when you look that up, it says to fascinate. Well, to fascinate is a verb. The dragon fascinates is what it does. It makes you feel good. What comes out of the mouth of the dragon is not fire. What comes out of the mouth of the dragon is good words and fair speeches. Everyone's looking for the wrong thing when they're looking for evil. What you look for is a smooth-talking con man that stands in a pulpit and won't tell you the truth, and he makes you feel good about yourself. Huh? Yeah, they worship the fire, and the fire comes out of the mouth of God. The Lord our God is a consuming fire. Now, and he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, Diabolos. And Diabolos means to cast out. Dia and Balo, D-I-A-B-O-L-O-S. comes from Dia and Balo. Balo is our word ball. It means to cast out. Ball means to throw which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. There's not going to be a thousand-year reign after this is over with. That's not true. Th now, what I teach on this was the stand of the church for 1,800 years. Now, here's the way most people think this is. You erase this again and put this up. They have all these charts, and they call them dispensational charts. And they say that, they say that, uh, that Adam lived in a time of innocence. Then they say after innocence came the dispensation of conscience. And then they say man lived under a dispensation of the law. And then came the dispensation of the church. Dispensation of the church. Then when the, and then when the church age ends, and the church has nothing to do with the Jew, even though the New Testament said a Jew is not outwardly, but of the heart. And Paul says in Galatians, the fifth chapter, as many as walk, he said, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creation. As many as walk according to this rule, the rule of a new creation, <coughs> and we are new creatures in Christ, peace be on them and upon the Israel of God. God's Israel are those who are new creatures in Christ. That's what we are. So where do they come up? Then they say you've got the dispensation of the church. Then they say you've got a, a, a pre-trib rapture pre-trib and then you, they say you got seven years of tribulation and then they say you've got a thousand years a thousand year reign and the only place they come up with thousand years is out of Revelation the 20th chapter now Satan is bound for a thousand years the word thousand is not the word thousand in the original text. The word thousand is the word kilia. If it were singular, it would be C-H-I-L-I-A-S, uh, kilias. That would be singular. But it's not. It's kilia, and that's plural. Now, I brought this out before, but let me make this very clear, as Richard Nixon would say. 
let me make this very clear. Let me make this very clear. Okay. Kila is plural. Thousand is not plural. You say, it looks like it's plural to me. Well, it's not. Not according to the Greek way of thinking. The Greek said any multiple of ten, multiple of a hundred, multiple of a thousand was a form of the original number that was multiplied by. A hundred, a ten, a hundred, or a thousand is a form of one. The Greeks said that one was not a number. That one was a generator of numbers. And they did not start counting and get to plural till they got to two. So, Kilia should be translated 2,000 or more. Now, if it were D-I-S-C-H-I-L-O-I, that would mean D Kilioi, meaning exactly 2,000. But this word Kilia means 2,000 or more. Now, what do I believe the 2,000 is? First of all, you can do away with this pre-trib rapture. That's not going to happen. We're going to be changed at the last trump, and it's going to happen here at the end of time. Aren't we going to be changed at the last trump? 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump. Last is the word eschatos. The last in the series where after which no other trumpet will sound. We're going to be changed at the end of time. One more time, go to Matthew 24. Matthew, the 24th chapter. If I can find trumpets at the end of time, I've already found the seventh trump in Revelation 10 and 7, Revelation 11 and 15. I've already found that at the end of time, haven't I? We found it. I didn't find it. We all found it together. Matthew 24. <clears throat> the apostles come to Jesus and they say, Jesus says in chapter 24, they take Jesus to show him the buildings of the temple in verse 1. And Jesus said, See all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall be not left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now the Jews believe because the temple covered 28 acres and it was composed of these 40-ton stones, humongous stones. They said it would last till the end of time. So they asked Jesus a question concerning the temple being leveled and the end of time. They could not foresee in 70 A.D. when Titus, the son of Vespasian, the Roman barbarian, would come in and level the temple in 70 A.D. So they asked Jesus a threefold question. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? What things? Well, the leveling of the temple. But they couple it all together because they think the temple will stay here till the end of time. It's too big to bring down. But Titus brought it down. They must have brought ropes and chains of all kinds and just drugged the... Drug the uh, stones off of this second temple. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? The word coming is parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A, parousia. What will be the sign of thy parousia? Your physical arrival. That's what that word parousia means. And of the end of the world. What's going to be the signs going on at the end of time? Well, he says, first of all, take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, in verse 5. Wars and rumors of wars, verse 6. Nation rising against nation. The word is ethnos, or ethnics rising against ethnics, non-Jews rising against non-Jews. The word is ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S. E-T-H-N-O-S. Isn't that going on today? <laughs> kingdom against kingdom. Famines, pestilence, earthquakes in many places, in diverse and various places. We got more earthquakes than we ever had before. One town in southern Japan has 20,000 tremors a day. You think that's earthquakes in various places? 
the big one is long overdue in Tokyo. If it comes, the trillion dollars or the couple of trillion dollars that we owe Tokyo will be called immediately due. That will bankrupt America when it comes. Not if it comes, when it comes. And they expect it any month or year at any time. Then you got the San Andreas Fault in California. You got the Madrid Fault that goes right down the Mississippi Valley. I was in Memphis back in the 60s at my sister's house one time when the house started shaking. And it shook everybody up pretty bad. When, when the house you're in is shaking like a baby's bassinet, it's frightening. I don't know how those people live. All these are the beginning of Saul's verse 8. That will live you to be afflicted, shall kill you, and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. False prophets will rise in verse 11. Uh, many will be offended, verse 10, and betray one another. That's going on like never before. They'll hate one another. That's going on. And because iniquity shall abound, the agape, walking in the commandments of God, will wax cold. And they that endure to the end, the word endure is hupomeno, H-U-P-O, M-E-N-O. That means to stay under fire, stay in the trial. Not that he that holds out and doesn't get lost. That's not what it's talking about. The one that stays in the fire, and who's going to see to it that we stay in the fire? God. And then... This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for witness unto all nations. That happened at Pentecost when Jews from every nation under heaven. The world is not going to have world revival. This is the verse that a lot of people use to say, world revival. No, that happened in Acts 2. Jews from every nation under heaven. It happened then. At the end of time, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse there in 2 Timothy 313. Things are not going to get better and better. That's not true. There's not going to be a world reviver. Fear not, little flock. For it's the Father's will to give you the kingdom. Only few are going to find the narrow gate, not a world revival. Then you see the desolation of abomination. Then you go down here and it, that there will be great tribulation, verse 21, such as was not from the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. We have great tribulation. It is getting worse and worse and worse. We have serial killers. We've got, we've got wars that we can't fix. We've got a world situation with Israel. All the eyes are on Israel. Is that something unusual? No. Was that going on 100 years ago? No. Israel became a nation again May 14, 1948 for the first time in 2,600 years. That has to do with the end of time. And then, verse 23, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, don't you believe it. If Benny Hinn says that he saw him in a Roman Catholic prayer tower, or that Jesus is going to appear on his stage in Africa, well, either Jesus or Benny Hinn is lying. This is red letters in it. This is the Word of God. Oral Roberts said he saw a 900-foot Jesus. He was smoking something or sniffing something that day because Jesus said not true. And then he says false prophets and false prophets will arise, great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. These guys are going to be so smooth talking in these churches that if it were possible, their words are going to sound so good they'll sound good to us. And they just barely keep from fooling the elect of God. But they can't fool us, can they? They sound real good. They have dracon in their mouth. They are fascinating the world. And then he says, verse 26, Wherefore they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert. The Jehovah's Witnesses said he was out in the desert. They say he's in that temple. And they talk to him out there in that Jehovah's Witness temple. And the elders of the Jehovah's Witness, or the Mormons, excuse me, the Mormons out there in that temple say they go in there and talk to God. Not so, Jesus said. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Don't you believe it? The next time, what was the original question? What will be the sign of your physical arrival? 
And then he says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the parousia that they ask about in verse 3, so shall also the physical arrival of the Son of Man be. And these are the signs in the last days, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And we find the birds of the air gathering together in the 19th chapter of Revelation when Jesus comes back on a great white horse and his eyes are as a flame of fire because someone has messed with his church and punched him in the eye. And he's coming back in flaming fire to take vengeance on all those that obey not the gospel. And then, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. That's a time element, isn't it? After the seven years, after the tribulation, let's see if we can find some trumpets here. After the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and that's the smoke from the bottomless pit where the scorpions are blowing smoke. You remember the word proud? A man, in the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy, when a man comes preaching any other doctrine and he's blaspheming the doctrine of Christ, he is proud. Tufao, T-U-P-H-O-O. It means to be slowly consumed by a smoke with no fire. It comes from the word tuflos, T-U-P-H-L-O-S. That word tuflos is the word blind. Men are going to be blinded because the sun is going to be darkened. And you remember, the scorpions are equated with locusts, aren't they? When the locusts came, they came every seven years. Isn't that amazing? Seven years. And they were larvae in the ground. They would come up out of the ground, and some of the writers say that they were six or eight inches long, the locusts there, these plague locusts. They weren't cicadas or katydids that we call locusts. They were like big, long grasshoppers, and they could strip a tree, a big, large tree, in just a matter of about 10 minutes of every leaf on it. And when, they, when the plague of locusts would come, remember they're equated with, they're equated with the, the scorpions equated with the locusts. The scorpions are false teachers they're going to teach false doctrine and block the light, aren't they? Well, these locusts, some of the writers tell us they would be a cloud of these billions of locusts for 20 miles, and it would be just dark under this cloud of locusts, and the sun couldn't come through. I don't believe this is talking about the literal sun being darkened. I believe it's talking about the light cannot be seen because of the false doctrine. Huh? I haven't looked it up. I need to look it up, don't I? I should. I'll do it. I've studied the locust. I need to look that word up. Now look here. Now where, did I, where was I? Okay, 29. After the tribulation of those days, the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light. When the moon doesn't give its light, how dark is it? It's pitch dark I mean it is dark as tar because the only thing that gives light at night is the moon I believe this is a picture and a type that even in the darkness there'll be little there'll be no truth going on and the stars shall fall from heaven what are the stars seven stars in the right hand of Christ the seven stars are the seven angels and our judgment begins to preach to the world. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. This is at the end of time, isn't it? This is at the end of time. This is after the tribulation of those days. Time factor, right? Okay, let's just see if we can find trumpets here. We're not going to be changed at a pre-trib rapture. Then shall uh, Tim LaHaye's preaching the one of the biggest lies in the world. And there, his and his buddy's picture was on... Uh, Time magazine, and they've made 62, they sold 62 million copies of that left behind. 62 million. One of the biggest lies that's ever been perpetrated because there is no pre-trib rapture. We're changed at the last trump. Let's look here and see. 
Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. What is the time factor here? After the tribulation of those days. We got angels sounding here, don't we? So we know there's no pre-trib rapture. That's why I raced that seven years. Now, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. And that's the end of time. One end of, end of heaven to the other. Okay. Now, let's go back to Revelation 20. Re back to Revelation 20. Now, Satan is going to be bound for a 2,000-year period. What is that 2,000 years? From Christ, from Jesus, a day is with the Lord as a 1,000 years, and a thousand years is one day over there in 1 Peter 3 and 8. A thousand years is one day with the Lord. The last days are the last 2,000 years from Christ to the end of time. End. That's a 2,000 year period are the last days not millennium, but kilia, which means 2,000 or more. Well, where was Satan bound back here at the time of Christ? Where was he bound? That word bound in verse 2 is the word dio. It's the Greek word dio. Do I believe that all these ages, these dispensations are true? No. How was Noah saved? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. There in Hebrews 11, chapter. Noah was saved by grace through faith, not by conscience. It's not true. Abraham had the gospel, didn't he? The scripture foreseeing that God would just... that. God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham. What was the gospel? The resurrection? What was the gospel preached to Abraham? The resurrection of Isaac from the dead loins of his father and the dead womb of his mother. He was 100 years old. She was 90, and it ceased to be after, with her after the manner of women, and she could not ovulate anymore. She couldn't give off an egg anymore. They couldn't have babies anymore. Yet God said, I will raise the dead from your loins and from your womb. That's the resurrection. That's the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now, let's get back over here. Let's get back over here to, let's see what the binding of Satan is. The word bound is dio. That's the word. Dio is the word bound. Well, let me put it over here. Move this out of the way. How much time do I have? Huh? No, I need more than that. Now, the word bound is dio. Dio means to forbid or to declare unlawful. Unlawful. Satan is forbidden. He's declared, something is declared unlawful to him. Let's go to Matthew, the 12th chapter, and see the binding of Satan, okay? Matthew 12, here's the binding of Satan at the time of Christ. Matthew, the 12th chapter. All right. Here's the binding of Satan. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Jesus is being accused of casting out devils because he hath the devil. And he says in verse 26, If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? If I've got a devil and I'm casting out devils, how's the kingdom going to stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, 
Beelzebub was the lord of the flies in the ancient world, and they believed that life came out of dung because flies were around dung, and they called that uh, Beelzebub means lord of the flies. And they said that's where life came from, the old pagans did. By whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils, and I'm going to come back to this verse next Sunday morning in casting out devils. If I cast out daemons by the Spirit of God, what is the Holy Spirit? The truth. And thy word is truth. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. What is the kingdom of God? It's an Kingdom of God was an old ancient term for Israel. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house? He's, talk <coughs> He's talking about entering to, into you and I as his elect and casting Satan out and him coming to live in us. Here's the binding of Satan. And spoil his goods except he first bind Dio, the strong man. That's where Satan is forbidden from deceiving for a 2,000-year period. Archelia, he's forbidden from deceiving the very elect if it were possible. There's a 2,000-year period in which the elect, the Gentile elect church, and Gentiles only during the days when Christ came back in Acts 2, Peter said this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel that in the last days or the last 2,000 years or the Kilia, which is wrongly translated in the 20th chapter of Revelation, that this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel that in the last days the, that the Lord would pour out of his spirit or his truth on all flesh only one flesh had received the truth prior to Christ. That was the Jews. They had received the truth. And now all flesh will receive the truth for a 2,000-year period. And Satan will be forbidden. Dio, he was forbidden when Christ came. And Christ extended the gospel to the Gentile church for a 2,000-year period. That's what the Kilia is. It's not 1,000. It's a bad translation. But gosh, how many bad translations do we have in the King James Bible? A whole bunch. How about daemon? We talked about this morning. Or demon. What a bad translation. So Satan is bound from deceiving. And if he's going to be cast out of us so the kingdom of God can come into us, he's cast out by the Spirit or by the Word of God, isn't he? Now let's go back over here to Revelation. The, that's the binding of Satan he, when he's cast out. Now let's go. Notice this is all, still all allegorical speech. Let's go back over here to Revelation, the, the 20th chapter. Now, let's just read verse 2 one more time. Do I have any time left? Two minutes on me. I'm just barely getting started on this. And bound him a, a thousand years, uh, and he laid hold on the dragon, Dracon, the smooth talker, the old serpent, which is the devil, and he talked smooth to Eve in the garden, didn't he? Talked to Jesus smooth when he took them on a high pinnacle, and he talked smooth through the mouth of all these false teachers. And he has been forbidden for a 2,000-year period from deceiving the Gentile church. There is no thousand years after this is all over. It's not true. The thousand years is not a thousand, but it's this time period right there. When the end comes, when the end of time comes, that's when we're going to be changed. That's when Jesus is going to conquer all of his enemies. Conquer all of his all enemies. Now, how could there be a thousand, year, a thousand years with Satan rising up at the end of the thousand years when the Bible says at the seventh trump, our bodies are going to be changed, and at the seventh trump, he's going to conquer all of his enemies. 
and yet Satan's going to rise up and people are supposed to die. The people that live out of the tribulation are supposed to be living into the thousand year and they're going to die during that thousand years. You, you've heard them say that, hadn't you? Huh? What's the last enemy that Christ is going to destroy? Death. There in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Well, yeah, they get where they get it all, Mary. I don't know where they get it. It's just stupid doctrine. Well, they say that you'll get a chance if you you get a chance. But how can you be dying, and how can Satan rise up at the end of the thousand years when the same operation that changes our bodies, according to Philippians, uh, the third chapter, that last verse there, verse twenty-one, how can our bodies be changed at the same operation that destroys all of his enemies, and yet people are dying all through the thousand years, and Satan rises up at the end of the thousand years. There will be a little season of Satan, and I believe we're living in it. I believe we're sitting right on the verge of the end of time. I don't know if I'll see it in my life, but I believe these young guys will see it. This thing is getting so bad in the world. Jesus is going to... Hi, it's very subtle. It really is. I'm out of time, ain't I? Mm. I really wanted to read that last. I'll just read. No, I won't. <laughs> I'll just read verse 3. I'll come back and explain more of it. And he was cast into the place of no knowledge for a 2,000-year period and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should. Now, here's why he was cast into the place of no knowledge that he should deceive the nations no more. The word nations is E-T-H-N-O-S. It means non-Jews. That that's us. He's bound or forbidden from deceiving us for a 2,000-year period. Yeah. Now, for people who complain and get upset at me for saying that these things about the... Uh, numbers that the way the Greeks counted numbers I told Mike I needed a uh, an entomological dictionary on mathematics and he found one up at Ball State and that's what the entomology of the Greeks said about their numbers they did not consider one a number any multiple of ten a hundred a thousand you can get that out of Jewish studies was a form of the original number therefore one thousand is not correct translation M mil annum is a bad translation Millennium. Bad translation. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to bow to your will. We believe that you're coming. We hope it's soon, Lord. Lord, if not, we'll go out to meet you here one day. Thank you for an understanding of your words and of your truth. God, give me strength and health and courage to stay in this message here and give me many years with the people at Grace and Truth Ministries, Lord, so we can found them in the Word of God. Forgive us where we fail. Give us strength and health and courage. God will give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen.